Good morning, all. And here we all are again in this new way where uh, you are there and we are here. Uh, but we are all together, and for that we can be very thankful. Jesus said, whenever two or three are gathered together in my name, there I will be with them. So we gather here this morning in Jesus' name and in his company. With live streaming, it's likely that our members are somewhat in process of, of logging on to the website, of uh, finding the icon uh, to click onto, so I'm stalling a little bit for time so that a mo majority of our members can be current uh, with us at this moment. And of course, we acknowledge that we look forward uh, very soon, we hope, uh, to being together again uh, physically in one place and in this uh, building. And until that time, though, we're grateful and we rejoice in the wonders of modern technology. I do want to remind you at the beginning that we'll be observing the Lord's Supper again this morning after Dan's sermon. So if you have not already, uh, please take a moment to prepare uh, the bread and the cup uh, for yourselves in your home. And trusting that you all had another Groundhog Day kind of a week, which is to say a blessed week, uh, full of contentment and joy, will join now in singing our first hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, a great hymn, something of an anthem of our church. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you established your faithfulness in heaven itself. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Ministry of the Word service. If we have uh, visitors, some who may be uh, with us for the first time, we extend a special welcome to you and trust your time together with us will be a blessing. Thank you for tuning in uh, to our time of worship, and I hope that you'll be able to uh, join us again uh, sometime uh, next week and hopefully actually come here to Believer's Chapel on Churchill Way and join with us in worship. God is on his throne. We keep reminding ourselves of that, don't we? As the opening psalm proclaimed, his faithfulness is secured in heaven itself. And I know we're all banking on that and trusting that the Lord in his mercy will soon bring relief to us from the pandemic, of course, uh, but also from the several other trials that many in our assembly are enduring. These are unusual times, to say the least. I know a side benefit to it is an improved prayer life. Uh, the Lord does use the challenges of life to nurture and discipline us to a closer walk with Him. There's been much talk in recent days about our obligations as citizens and about corporate responsibility. Uh, the coronavirus has brought that to the forefront. As Christians, we have an obligation uh, to pray for our leaders and for those who rule over us. Uh, that's our responsibility as well. Uh, you know that place in Paul's first letter to Timothy where he urged that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf for all men, for kings and for all who are in authority, he said, so that we might lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Well, there's an added urgency to that uh, today, of course, and I know you're all doing that. Our government and our business leaders need our prayers. And I know that many of you, too, are in special need of prayer. And so as we've done the last few Sundays, I want to say again, if you have special needs, if uh, you have uh, difficulties that have come upon you in these last few weeks, we want to know about that. Uh, let your request be made known uh, to God, the scriptures say, and we want you to know, we want you to let them be made known to us as well so that we can share in your petitions. 
Well, I'm really looking forward, Dan, to your sermon this morning, and Dan will come now and read our scripture passage for this morning. Thank you, Mark, and good morning to all of you. I hope you've had a good week, a restful week, and a week, as uh, Mark suggested, but full of prayer. We're going to look this morning at Psalm 46. That will be my text and my sermon. Next week, I will begin a series in 2 Peter. But this morning, Psalm 46, because I felt this was an appropriate psalm for this season and experience that we're going through. It's a great psalm. It begins, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come, behold the works of the Lord who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for this time together. What a privilege it is to be doing this as we have been instructed to do, to gather together and not forsake the gathering together of the saints on this Lord's Day. Uh, it's a strange experience to look out on an empty auditorium and, and yet know that there are people watching and listening throughout the city and across the state and other places. And so we're here together in spirit, if not in body. And the privilege is great because we have this opportunity to pray together. We have this opportunity to read the scriptures together, and then consider the meaning of the text together. And I pray, Lord, that as we do that, you'd bless us, that you'd build us up in the faith. We're reminded from this that uh, you are a stronghold. You help us in times of need, in times of difficulty, and in times of ease at all times. And so, Lord, help us to see that from this psalm. You're absolutely sovereign, you are in control, but you are not brute force. We're not driven by fate. You are personal, you are wise, you are loving, and you're in control of our lives for our good and for your glory. And that's good news, Father. That is the good news of this psalm. And I Pray that you would bless us because we have trials in life. We all have trials in life. We live in a fallen world, and so difficulties are to be expected. And particularly difficulties are to be expected if we're your children living in a fallen and hostile world. But you are for us, and as this psalm reminds us, you are with us always, constantly. May we understand that from our time together again. And we do understand that, Father, but may we be reminded of that and more firmly grounded in it at this time and trust you more fully. 
Well, we pray for ourselves spiritually, Lord. We pray for ourselves physically, materially as well, and we pray particularly that you bless those who are in need with uh, special needs, people who are threatened in a particular way by this virus that uh, challenges all of us, but we pray you'd bless those who are in particular difficulty, whose immune systems have been compromised from illness and from procedures. We think of uh, Madeline Hargrove, bless her, keep her safe. I pray for Audrey Harrell that you'll continue to strengthen her and bless her health. I think of Margaret Smith and Betty Radford, keep them safe and strong. And Lord, there are other names that could be mentioned and certainly all of us are in a situation where we need your protection and I pray for that and I pray for your encouragement to us in this hour. We pray, uh, Lord, that you would bless us in other ways. It's not only the health of the nation that we're concerned about, it's the economy that is under stress as well and it's a crisis in that way and we think of those who are unemployed now and we think of those who have businesses and they are threatened by this situation. I pray that you would bless them. I pray that you would bring good out of this. I pray that you would protect the livelihoods of those who attend our church and others throughout this land and the world for that matter. So Lord, we, we pray your blessing upon us materially as well. And I pray, Lord, for the wisdom of our leaders whom you have placed over us. Mark mentioned that. And we do pray for our president and our vice president and the task forces that are around them and the advice that they're getting and our governor and our city leaders. And I pray that you give them wisdom and that uh, they would follow wise direction and that you would bring all of this to a conclusion soon. But we know that will take place in your time and according to your will. And so we pray that you would enable us to rest in you until then. Father, bless the time we spend together now in your word. And bless, we pray, the service of the Lord's Supper at the end. Again, what a privilege it is to, to participate in that. How important it is. Bless us, Lord, in this hour, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Fifteen twenty seven was a tough year for Martin Luther. The Emperor Charles V was trying to crush the Reformation. And Luther's physical ailments were so severe, they almost put him in the grave. It was a time of pestilence. Biographers have called it the fatal year and the year of his deepest depression. But it was in that year that Luther wrote one of the greatest hymns of the Christian faith. A mighty fortress is our God. It's been called the battle hymn of the Reformation and has often raised courage in Christians during times of danger and great trial. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Those words are loosely translated from the first verse of our psalm, Psalm 46, when the reformer was going through his severest spiritual and physical trials, when his life's work seemed on the verge of collapse, Luther gained encouragement from this psalm. It was his favorite, and no wonder. It proclaims God's complete sufficiency for our safety, and it declares His absolute sovereignty over nature and time. He guides history. The psalm divides into three parts. First, Verses 1 through 3, God is declared a refuge against natural calamities. Second, in verses 4 through 7, God is a refuge against national calamities. And third, in verses 8 through 11, we have an invitation given to all to come to Him. It was written to be sung by the sons of Korah in a time of crisis. 
In the present, believers read and recite it to gain confidence in the Lord in times of danger and uncertainty. It begins with a statement of faith and absolute confidence. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. That can be said of nothing and of no one in the universe except the Lord God. He alone is a mighty fortress, a bulwark never failing. Men don't understand that. Men put their confidence in all kinds of fortresses in this world, in their financial portfolios, their bank accounts and stock holdings. They search for the best investments, which is good and wise. But there are no guarantees in any of that. The year 2008 proved that to us. Now again, in 2020, we're getting that same lesson. Things happen that cannot be anticipated, and hope collapses. Others put their confidence in their intelligence, in their education, their special skills or health or good looks. Whatever a person feels is his or her strength. But they're all subject to failure an unexpected breakdown in health, or the downsizing of a company, a tragedy in the family. Only our God is a sure fortress. He is the only unfailing refuge in times of difficulty as well as in times of ease. And the psalm declares that in a vivid way. It envisions the worst kind of natural disaster, of the, the world falling apart, of the earth quaking, of mountains crumbling and slipping into the sea. To the ancients, the mountains were the, a symbol of stability, as they are for us, like the Rock of Gibraltar. Many considered them to be the oldest parts of the world. The Babylonians thought of the mountains as the pillars of the earth that held up the sky. If they gave way, everything was lost. For the Israelites, this wasn't altogether poetic imagery. They lived along the Great Rift Valley, which is a major fault line that extends from Lebanon down through Africa. The people of that area experienced earthquakes when mountains shook and rocks fell. A major one occurred in Judah and in Israel during the reign of Uzziah the king. But still, the faithful could say, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar, because God is our refuge. He called it all into being, out of nothing. When chaos was on the face of the earth, water and darkness, He spoke and there was light. He spoke and dry land appeared. He called up the mountains out of the sea and they can't slip back without His approval. The earth can't shake unless He shakes it. Which means we who have trusted in Him have a refuge of rest and security. So, how do we explain that year, 1527, and Luther's affliction and depression? How do we explain Christians going to a martyr's death or falling victim to a plague? How is God any kind of fortress then in those circumstances? Well, that's the question we naturally ask if we assume the psalm is promising ease and escape from hardship or pain. But it's not. Nowhere does the Bible promise that to an earnest saint. In Acts chapter 14, verse 22, after being stoned by a mob, Paul told a young church in Asia Minor to expect such things. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. That's our future, the kingdom of God. That's our hope. In fact, this psalm moves toward that. 
We have a glorious future. It is certain, it is fixed, it is predetermined by the Lord, and we can rest in that sovereign God and His will and that hope and what He has already achieved for us. But it can be a very difficult path to that kingdom. That's what he is saying through many tribulations. We must enter the kingdom of God. Satan is real and he never sleeps. What the psalm assures us of is that no enemy, no sickness or sadness will touch us except the Lord allows it for our good and his glory. He can even use it for our growth to make us a help to others when they go through difficulties as well. The, the point is, we must trust Him through it all, like Job. When everything was taken from Him, His wealth, His children, His health, when His wife told Him to curse God, when His friends accused Him, He held fast and said, though He slay me, yet will I trust Him. And that's what the, the faithful of this psalm were saying. Their confidence was in the Lord. They knew He was and always is an all-sufficient Savior, a real refuge and strength. Luther even expressed that resolve and confidence in his hymn, let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, His kingdom is forever. This world and the things of it are unreliable. They are just a shadow, but God is not. He is completely trustworthy, reliable, and able. And He does deliver from calamity. He does deliver from sickness and danger. He does so in miraculous ways. He delivered Paul from that stoning. He delivered Luther from that terrible year. He delivers all of us all of the time. Every breath we take has the potential of death in it. But every breath of life is a gift from Him. That's Acts 17, verse 25. He gives us strength. He gives us inner strength. He gives us rest and peace so that we can face life's calamities. In verse 4, the crisis changes from confidence during natural disasters. The psalmist states confidence before national threats war and the raging of man. The city of God is under siege, and yet it is at peace. It is absolutely secure. Verse 4, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. She, God will help her when morning dawns. Historically, the city is Jerusalem, and the river that makes glad is the streams of Siloam that supplied Jerusalem with fresh water. The circumstances behind this is a great deliverance by God. It is probably when He saved Jerusalem from the invasion of the Assyrian king Sennacherib during the reign of Hezekiah, it's recorded in 2 Kings chapters 18 and 19. The Assyrian army came down on the land like a tidal wave, sweeping away city after city until it came up to the very walls of Jerusalem. Sennacherib's field commander, Rabshakeh, stood before the city and he delivered an ultimatum to the leaders who were standing on the wall. And basically it was surrender and become slaves or be annihilated. Then he sent a message to Hezekiah boasting that the Lord would not deliver him. Hezekiah took the letter to the temple. He spread it out before the Lord and he prayed, deliver us from his hand. 
And the Lord answered through the prophet Isaiah that he would save the city. That night, the angel of the Lord went through the camp of the Assyrians and struck down 185,000 soldiers. 2 Kings 19 says that when men rose early in the morning, behold, all of them were dead. Now that's verse 5 of the psalm. God will help her when morning dawns. The romantic English poet Lord Byron was inspired by that and wrote a really a magnificent poem titled The, De the Destruction of Sennacherib. I'd like to read the whole thing, but I won't. I'll just read a couple of verses. It begins, The Assyrian came down like the wolf on the fold, and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold. It ends with the line, And the might of the Gentile, unsmote by the sword, hath melted like snow in the glance of the Lord. Well, that's the way verse 6 puts it. He raised his voice, the earth melted. The psalm was written to commemorate that great event. But it goes beyond that event to celebrate the assurance the people of God have in every age of God's help in time of need. The assurance Jerusalem had was God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. The temple was there in Jerusalem. That's where he dwelt, at least symbolically. The church is now his temple, and he literally dwells in us. So, we will not be moved. Outside might be chaos. Mountains falling, enemies assailing. But inside the city, inside the church, there is peace and safety as we look to the Lord. There's a stream that makes glad the city of God. Even though the Assyrian siege of Jerusalem, even during that, the, the city was constantly supplied with fresh water from the stream of Siloam. It never failed. And we too, as, as God's people, have a constant life-giving stream. It is the Holy Spirit. Jesus spoke of him in those terms in, in John chapter 7 as rivers of living water flowing from our innermost being. That was his promise to the thirsty as he stood up in the temple on the day of the great feast and invited them, the thirsty, those longing spiritually to come to him, to drink, to believe. And they would have the Holy Spirit who gives life to the dead and who refreshes the weak. He makes a stand in the trials. I say this often, but it's true. We live not a natural life as believers in Jesus Christ. We live a supernatural life. We have within us, as the temple of God, the church is the temple, the individual believer is the temple. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. He enables us. He strengthens us. He's with us. It is a supernatural life. And so he makes us to stand in the trials. Kingdoms tottered, the psalmist said, but God's city is not moved. His people stand firm. His people hold fast. That's the assurance we have because as the second section, this second section concludes, the Lord of hosts is with us. There's the assurance we have. In fact, the third section concludes in the very same way. Verse 11, the Lord of hosts is with us. That is our present assurance. If God is for us, Paul asked, who's against us? Of course, it's a rhetorical question. If God is for us, it doesn't matter who's against us. Satan himself and all of his minions are against us. The world is against us. It doesn't matter. God is for us. But Psalm looks beyond the present to the future, to the city that Abraham was looking for, a city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. It looks, it looks forward to a, a day when God shall defeat all armies and all enemies and establish his rule on the earth and do it with great force. The proof of that is what God has done. He had annihilated 
Sennacherib's army, spears and bows, shields and bodies lay strewn on the ground. And the sons of Korah invite the world, the world in rebellion, to make, to, that, that makes war on him and on his people to take a look and consider it and make peace. Come, behold the works of the Lord who has wrought desolations in the earth. Get a look at it. Behold God's power. That's what you're fighting against is what the psalmist is saying. And your efforts are futile. They are doomed to failure just as Sennacherib's were. The Lord is described in various ways in the Bible. He's a father. He is a shepherd. He is a husband. He is a king. And here he is a warrior. Not because he enjoys war, but to protect his people, to further his purpose, and to end war. Verse 9, he makes wars to cease. He does that by making war. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. God will disarm this world, not by gentle persuasion, but by force. Now, that's clear from this psalm, but it's clear from many other passages. It's clear, for example, from Psalm 2. God laughs at the nations in revolt, and He gives them to His Son as His inheritance. The ends of the earth. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, shatter them like earthenware. Now, all of time is moving toward that day. And it is good that we know that. It's good that we believe and think of that continually. We get so troubled by all that goes on in the world, and, and rightly so. Men are living today as they were living in Isaiah's day when they call evil good and good evil. But we're not to be discouraged. We're to be hopeful. He will break the bow and in the war. And so in light of that, in light of that glorious future, that certain future, the sons of Korah sing, cease striving and know that I am God. Now we often apply that to ourselves in time of stress with the, the uh, sense of uh, stop being anxious and rest in the Lord, trust in the Lord. And we certainly should do that. But that's Probably not the meaning here. It's, it's not a comfort for the harassed, but a, uh, a rebuke for unbelievers to the rebellious. It means stop fighting. Lay down your arms. Surrender to God. Repent of your rebellion and trust in the Lord. Cease striving and know that I am God. God is a living personal God involved in history. He is the creator of time and history. So he's involved in every detail of our lives. And he will certainly protect us for his own glory and our good. And because of that, we too can, as it were, cease striving and know that he is God. We can make that application to us. And we should. We should rest in Him. That's certainly the implication of the last verse, of verse 11. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. That phrase, the Lord of hosts, was uh, the war cry of Oliver Cromwell's army. It gave his soldiers courage to go into battle. Well, it should encourage us in the, the spiritual battle that we face daily. Those words have been the encouragement of God's people down through the ages. The, the Lord who is with us is the Lord of hosts, Lord Sabaoth, the Lord of the armies. That's the meaning of the phrase. He commands all of the armies of the world, the armies of earth, the armies of heaven, the seen and the unseen. The story of Elisha and his servant in the town of Dothan may be the, the best illustration of that and what it means to us, to the Lord's people. It's found in 2 Kings chapter 6. I think you probably know 
the story, the king of uh, Syria sent his army to capture the prophet Elisha, who was in the city of Dothan. In the morning, his servant got up and saw the Syrian army encamped all around the town. In a panic, he ran to the prophet and said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Elisha remained completely calm. He wasn't at all fearful. He prayed to God that he would open the eyes of his servant so that he could see that hidden reality. And the Lord did, and the servant looked, and the text says, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Elisha and his servant and the city were protected. They were in God's fortress. It's no different today. God works in the invisible. And when a person understands that, knows about God's protection, that He is with us, then we can sing with the sons of Korah, we will not fear, though the earth should change. Now the Lord wants us to know that. The Lord wants us to sing that and to rest in Him as our stronghold, as our place of safety. Luther did. He seized on this great hymn, or rather he seized on this great psalm, and the, the name within this psalm, that name, Lord of Hosts, that title that we considered, and we find it in his hymn. Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side. The man of God's own choosing. Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth, his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. He is the Lord of hosts. He is the God of Jacob. And that's another magnificent description given in verse 11. God of Jacob. Jacob was the schemer. He was from birth, the heel grabber who would try to trip his older twin, Esau. And he did. From taking his birthright to stealing his blessing and deceiving his father. And yet, God had chosen him from birth, from before birth, before either brother had done good or bad. He made a sovereign choice of Jacob over Esau, even though Esau would be the firstborn. And he made promises to Jacob and he kept them. He was loyal to him all of the days of Jacob's life. In fact, when Jacob comes to the end of his life, he gives this beautiful description of the Lord in, chapter, in Genesis 48, verse 15, where he speaks of the God who fed me all the days of my life, or the God who shepherded me. And that he did. In spite of Jacob's failures, in spite of his slow Growth, the Lord never forsook him. He was with him always. And if the Lord is your God, it is the same for you. It is all true for you, for every believer in Jesus Christ. Both of these titles, the Lord of hosts and God of Jacob, express what Calvin called the double prop on which our faith rests. God's infinite power and his fatherly love. It's all for us, all working together for us as his people. He will always be faithful to protect us with his infinite, unconditional love and the very power that brought the universe into existence and will subdue all of the enemies. It begins with the assurance that God is our refuge, a place where a person could find rest and shelter from the storm. It ends with the assurance that He is our stronghold. It's like a high place in the rocks where people would build fortresses that would keep them safe from attack. The Lord is our steep fortress, our strong stronghold that no one can scale. 
He is impregnable. We're safe in Him. As the Lord Himself put it in John chapter 10, we are in His hand and secure. In fact, we are in His Father's hand. And since the Father is greater than all, no one can snatch them out of the Father's hand. John chapter 10, verses 28 and 29. The triune God is a mighty fortress, strong and faithful, always with us, which means with us in these strange times. As I come to the end of another sermon preached to an empty auditorium, I'm wondering what I know most of you are wondering. When will this end? I don't know. But I think a better question that we should be asking is, is there a lesson to be learned in this? Well, there are probably a few. But one I would suggest is, we are mortal. There's nothing like a plague to remind us that we're mortal, that death is is the reality, and we all face the same inevitable end. Maybe not today, but someday. If that seems grim, it is, but it's true. It is foolish to ignore that. That's what the world does, because it has no answer for the grave. It has no hope, and so it ignores the question. It ignores the issue. But it's wise to think about it. It's wise, as we're told elsewhere, to number our days and to make them count for the Lord and for eternity. But our psalm teaches us something more. And that is, the Lord is with us. He is with us now and will be with us to the very end and to our last hour. John Wesley understood that well. Good quotes get quoted often, and I've quoted this before. On the day he died, Wesley had nearly lost his voice and could be understood only with difficulty. But at the end, he collected his strength and called out, the best of all is God is with us. Then raising his hand and slightly waving it triumphantly, he said again, the best of all is God is with us. That's true. Is he with you? He is if you put your faith in him, in the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God who became one of us, became a man that he might die in our place. Because he did and became the sacrifice, the one who suffered for our sins in our place as our substitute, he took away our sin. He removed our guilt and is the only Savior of the world. That is true for everyone who trusts in him, who has put his or her faith in him. That's where our safety and security are. That's The assurance is given in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. We are safe at all times in Him, in all the trials of life, and in the final trial when we face death itself. Because He has gained forgiveness for us and life, we are in Him and we cannot be removed. What a blessing that is. What a blessing to be able to pass out of this world with the Lord. In Him, in His hand. Able to say, in that last hour, God is with us. God is with me. Come to Christ if you've not. Enter that strong tower. Believe in Him and be saved. I'm going to close in prayer in just a moment, but again, after the prayer, there'll be a hymn, and then we will take the Lord's Supper together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for this great text of Scripture 
that reminds us of your absolute sovereignty, your greatness, that you are real in spite of what the world may say, and that you are with us, and that you are protecting us presently, and you will bring us into that glorious kingdom to come. Help us to rest in you in these difficult days. Help us to know that you are for us, and since you are for us, nothing can be against us. We give you praise and thanks for that. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, who came into the world to save sinners, and he saved an innumerable multitude by grace, and we've received it through faith alone. Thank you for him. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.